Steve. Oh, so I'm Steve. I'm Stephen Morris, and I play the drums with the band New Order. And uh, before that, Joy Division. So, so tell us about when when you first met Tony. Well, sort of. You didn't really actually meet Tony. You just knew who he was. Yeah, you, you, your impressions of Tony Wilson were formed by seeing him read the news and seeing him do all the daft, what it's now the and finally things like the and gliding stunt. But there were there were loads of them. They, you know, he, he was just like the comic at the end of whatever they called Granada reports in them days. So you know, you you, you got this impression of him that he was kind of like this ex-hippie who somehow managed to wangle a job with Granada and um and he got he did um so it goes the um events thing and he you got an idea that he kind of had the same sort of musical taste as, as you um if you were an hippie and um yeah he, he was he was quite controversial, and you know, he'd say things, and you think, well, if I ever see that, if I ever see that Tony Wilson, I'll tell him he's wrong. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of people had that. They seemed to arouse those sentiments in people that, yeah, they wanted to, if not have a go at him, you know, point out the error of his ways, and that, and particularly with, with Joy Division, I and mean, that was when, um, I suppose, when we. Well, we hadn't met him. You saw him at you saw him at, at gigs, but they um, he collared him at the Stiff Chiswick contest, and that was sort of I think that was f- the first physical contact of uh, pinning him against the wall and jabbing a finger in his face and listen, Wilson. But he got it all the time, you know. <laughs> Everybody did that to Tony. Um, I, I think he expected it. I mean, you you know, you were talking about Ian Curtis there, uh, and that was his introduction to Tony. So, so what made Tony end up, you know, falling in love with uh, your band Joy Division? I don't know. He ended up falling in love with Joy Division, if I'm honest. We, me and Ian, sort of alternately kept ringing him up. I don't know. How we got his number. How we got his number is a bit of a mystery. But we were. Oh, I know how we got his number. Um, Gillian. My wife and keyboard player with the New Order uh, bumped into him at a gig and one of us had had sent him an ideal for living and he said, here's my number, get him to give us a ring. That's right. So it was actually Gillian who got his phone number and we started ringing him up and then nothing happened. And then he was never in. And I I I think Ian actually... Went in and waited for a bit and didn't see him and dropped a tape off and stuff like that. Um, but it, was, was that before? I mean, my memory's a bit cloudy. I can't remember that was before or after. It must have been before the Stiff Chiswick contest. It must have been before it because he played it on the. No, what did he play it on? Um, so it goes or what's on before or after? I can't remember. Theoretically, sensibly speaking, it must have been after. Because we pinned him against the wall, and then yeah, that's right. Then he put, and I played an ideal for living on, on the Granada, whatever it's called, <laughs> Granada Report. So and, and um, at the time with an ideal for living, you were trying to get it released on Rabid Records, weren't you? Uh, oh, we hadn't got a clue really. We hadn't got a clue. Um, I mean, Rabid were they'd done. Spiral Scratch, that was sort of Manche- made them Manchester's foremost punk label. So, uh, yeah, I can't. Um, I think Terry uh, went to see uh, Tosh because Terry Mason, now uh, he's done everything. He started, started off, uh, he was the drummer, the guitarist. He's, he's had every, every uh, possible role within. Joy Division and New Order. I uh, can't think of a job he's not had. No, he's one of them. He's been promoted new, on numerous occasions, but at that time he was our manager, and I think he was... He, like, he, he talked to everybody. He talked to... Because um, there was that... Yeah, there was that few people doing it. There was the Buzzcocks who got to Richard Boone, and, uh, and through him, that's probably how we got on to uh, Tosh at Rabid. 
Uh, and how did you feel when Tosh turned, turned Joy Division down because of the Nazi emblem, emblems and all that stuff? <laughs> um, um, I just think, well, fuck you, mate. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll go elsewhere. Um, no, no, I haven't really. Um, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It, it's just. I thought, well, we're not really Nazis. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, we're not actually trying to invade Poland or anything like that. It's just flirting with Nazi, Nazi imagery, or is what you call it nowadays. But um, no, no, I think Tosh had principles and he, he, he was not going to be swayed. So um, we put it out. Um, and we made a balls of that, didn't we? <laughs> put it out on the, as a seven-inch record, thinking that if you put, you could put 15 minutes of music on a seven inch record and it'd sound fine and it's only when you think we put it on in pips and like it was half the volume of every record that had been on before and he just wanted the ground to swallow you up it's like <laughs> it's not our record um in fact that was one of rob's why we never thought of it before? Of course, Rob's first thing he did, reissue it, make it a 12-inch and it'll be louder. You see, we didn't know those things at the time. We just thought, you made a record and that was it. Um, yeah, that was an idea. So, so how, how did, the, you know, when did Tony start having an impact? I mean, obviously with the Unknown Pleasures album, because he, he, he got the well, money together the, for that, didn't he? Tony, um, the first thing we did for Tony was Factory Sampler. Um, how did we get to do The Was Us? Drutty Column, John Dowie and Cabaret, Cabaret Voltaire, and he'd done uh, he'd done the Factory Club when we played there a few times, and he was going to do Factory Records, and that you know that, that thought this was going to be it, just bung out this record, um, but it was obviously different because at first it was a double double EP, which I don't think there's been there weren't. There's not been many double EPs in plastic sleeves, and yeah, you know, it was quite an interesting design concept he had, he had going there. And um, that was how we first met uh, Martin, Martin Anna, who was one of the pa partners in Factory Records. And we went up to Rochdale Cargo Studios, and there's another ex hippie. No, he was still a hippie, I think, uh, Martin. Martin Annett, who was Martin Zero when he did Spiral Scratch. So we got him in the end. Martin not got a didn't get the record label, but we got the producer. Um, and then recorded it. And it was, a, uh, I remember going round to Palatine Road, Alan Erasmus's flat, um, which became the factory offices, and putting these seven inch records in sleeves. And then they had this. Um, thing with bound the sleeve in plastic and uh nathan mcgoff was in charge of that but we had to stop him doing it after a bit he was making a complete pig's ear of it um yeah so that was that was us doing the um, cottage industry bit and putting the factory sample out and then that sold really well and um then we ended up doing an album which was unknown pleasure. <laughs> I mean, Joy Division and New Order obviously made the money, which uh, meant that, you know, Tony and Rob would eventually open, the, you know, the Hacienda Club. Uh, and it, again, at that, that, that time, did, did you find um, with Tony that he was quite persuasive and he, he'd always managed to make you think along his lines, even when often you wouldn't? Tony, hmm, persuasive. He kind of, he was persuasive in the sort of outfox you kind of way by using words that you didn't know the meaning of. You would agree with him even though you didn't quite know what it was you were agreeing to. Um, yeah, he was, he'd always mask something with a quote. It was always, as somebody once said, you know, and he was... He, he wasn't persuasive in the sense that you'd end up, you'd, he'd argue with you. You just ended up agreeing with him, really, I think, because you wanted to go home. <laughs> 
Well, because uh, well, there are a lot of people that said that. Yeah, that the, it would well, weigh you down. According to Cho and Lai, um, <laughs> well, who am I to disagree with? That bloke I'd never heard of before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and I mean, did he continue to do that throughout? I mean, when you look back on it, you think, blimey, did I ever have any control, really, of what I did? Um, yeah, yeah, really. Did there was you come out of meetings sometimes, and you think, what, what, what have we agreed? What, what? And then you go to the next meeting, and it'd be well as we as we decided at the last meeting, we're doing this, 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 or this. And hang on, Tony, are you sure that's what we 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 agree? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. What, what what's the biggest example of that that you can remember? The biggest example of him. <laughs> um, I I can't. For the life of me, because I, you know, I, you know, my eyes just sort of, sort of, you, you, you glaze over a little bit. I mean, the the whole thing about how the hacienda came into being uh, has always been a mystery. And to the end, Tony always said it was Rob's idea. Rob, I, I don't know, I, I think said it was something to do with Tony. I know, yeah, no, Rob said it was, it was a good way of getting money out of Tony, that was right. But nobody would actually admit that this thing which became the most, in, you know, most important club in the world, no one would say, yeah, that was definitely, <laughs> that was my idea, mate, I thought of that. Um, no, I don't know why that was. But, um, yeah, there's loads of things with the, um, with the Hacienda it's just, hang on, who, who is running this place? It was, hang on, it's been run as a what? A workers' cooperative? How long has that been going on? Ah, uh, um, no, I think it was it was mostly stuff to do the uh, the, uh, the hacienda where decisions were sort of washed over you. And did it do you? Did it do you nothing though? Knowing that. Basically, New Order were the lifeblood of the place. It was transfusions of your money that kept the place going. Yeah, yeah, it did. It did do me nothing. Um, when you're on tour in uh, America and like, everyone's moaning about, oh, I don't know what to go on. Yeah, well, you see, the thing is, we, we're doing this to make the money to stop the Ascend from closing. You know, it's, no, 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 no. We're going to have some money when we go. No, no, we'll get some. And then when you get back, you have a meeting and it's like, oh, well, uh, we had a good month last month. Uh, this month's not, not doing so well. We, you know, we need another, we need another 40,000. And you'd have, well, how much did we make on that last tour? And it'd be like, 41,000. Oh, that's funny how these things work, isn't it? Okay, there you go. <laughs> and it had disappeared. I mean, the thing was, the, as I said before, the thing that didn't buy any, then we did this tour and we actually did make a load of money. And then we got, oh, Tony's having a, having a spe special Hacienda meeting at the town hall. Oh, the town hall. We've never had a meeting at the town hall before. Oh, oh hey, great. Oh, cocktails and everything. And then it's like, well, we're very fortunate that, um, you know, with the market and it going about, you know, the, with the way property's going and all that, it's a good thing to invest in property. And, you know, the big mistake that we made with the Hacienda was never buying the building. And then there's a big lead up to it. And, and now we've got an opportunity to buy the building. And it's like, oh, hang on, how much money did we make on last tour? It wouldn't actually be this sum I've written on this piece of paper, would it, that we'd be asking? Well, yeah, it's that sort of sum, yes. Um, just, no, we can't do it, we can't do it. We can't, please don't. And then, uh, you're outvoted. The number of times I got bloody outvoted. Mind you, in the long term, he was probably right, wasn't he? Yes, but we couldn't even get that right. I mean, if we could, actually have bought the building like the way most people buy a house. Uh, it would have been, yeah, it would have made sense, but no, 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 no. I think we had to go to the mafia for a mortgage or something like that, and they're not great deals you get from them. Um, so, no, it didn't, it 
didn't work out too well. Uh, and how did you feel when uh, you, you had all these sort of dodgy gangster types around the club and everything? <sighs> I couldn't. I couldn't actually go to the hacienda that often, unless you know the only time I could go was when there was somebody else was driving and I was completely bladdered because I just used to worry myself to death about the place. You'd just walk in and you'd, it, oh, it's a bit of a mess. It's going to need painting soon. Painting, that's going to cost a fortune. Um, oh, them speakers are blown. That's going to cost a bit. And you just go, I'd just get, I'd walk through the door and get, if I could actually get through the door because I did get knocked back, knocked back on numerous occasions. And I just worry. I just worry as soon as I got in, and I couldn't have a drink because I was running. Gillian and whoever we brought with us back home. So, you know, it's it very rarely I could actually go in there and relax, and I could only relax by, you know, getting completely off my head. How do you get knocked back on a club that your you, money is keeping afloat? Well, the first night I couldn't. I didn't get in. Because I I think it was a lot to do with Gillian's sister because I always went with Gillian and Gillian's sister used to go and pretend to be Gillian. So we'd turn up, you know, St Stephen and Gillian. Uh, Sorry, yeah, we've got one inside already. You know, I uh, know she looks just like you, and I don't know who this one is. No, 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 no. It happened. It happened a few times, and it was always because Kim had gone and. And I couldn't really pull rank on the people at the door because they were bigger than me. And, yeah, you know, I just want to people who, yeah, you know, I've been knocked back at... I've got one of them faces that doesn't open doors. <laughs> and, and, I mean, I mean, again, you know, uh, all of this went on for years and years. You know, you've got this great legacy of music that you built up. And uh, hopefully you've been making a few bob the last couple of years. Mm. Uh, how, how did you feel when when you heard that that Tony was well, kind of, you know, ill and on his way out? Oh God, I thought that's absolutely terrible. Uh, shocked. I felt, I felt really. I, I felt really shocked. I felt really shocked when uh, I first heard Tony Tony was ill. I mean, the first thing I heard was actually um, a bit before that. I had, he had a sort of mini stroke, and I thought, oh God, you think it's. A, Tony's had a stroke, and then it turned out he was the, you know, it was the most mildest stroke you could possibly have. But you, you still think, God, it's Tony. He's, you know, he's he's fit as a fiddle. You know, he'd go he'd go on forever. And when we found out, and it's really only twelve months ago, found out that uh, he had cancer. I was, you know, just couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it, and. The, the he just went he just went so quickly, just went he just seemed to, you know, sh not shrivel up, but I think it was the treatment that did did that to him. But um, no, I was I was really shocked, really shocked because he never, never ever th thought it would happen to someone like him because he was, um, you know, he used to say full of beans, but that's not right really. He was always. Um, you know, he always seemed to be on always top on of it. He was always on the go, Tony, yeah. Um, you know, he was on the telly. When he, and he had, he had loads of, there was loads of things that he was into. I was very uh, interested in his um, his political ambitions, really. The way you, I think he was trying to connive to turn the North West into some sort of its own autonomous region so he could become the emperor of Manchester or something. I thought it was great because I could see Tony doing that. You know, I could see Tony going into politics, you know, and being a controversial person. He couldn't could do anything without, without being controversial. But I thought it's it great. You know, I'd well, vote well, for you. I was going to say, when was the last time you saw him? The last time I saw um, uh, Tony was... Um, it wasn't long before... It for um, he, he died. He, he came to um, Bernard's wedding reception, and I'm, you know, I'd not seen him for a bit, and you know, he was walking with a stick, and he, you know, he, 
it obviously wasn't well. But um, when he sat down and talked to him, it was great because, like, underneath it all, you know, they, there was, Tony was still there and he, you know, he'd still go on about, just to keep going on about the Neil Young, Neil Young and the Eagles concert at the Palace. And uh, I'd say, oh, I've got a tape of that. And I'd say, I know you daft sod, you've given me a tape of it. Oh, all right. <laughs> I was going to give him another one. <laughs> um... And he was fine, you know. He, he he still had that sort of spark about him, which sort of made you optimistic, really. And then, sort of a few short weeks or a month later, and uh, yeah, we'd gone. I mean, I mean, how hard did it hit you? Because again, you know, you've been through tragedy as youngsters, haven't you? You know, when when Ian Curtis, who was one of your best mates, as well as being a member of the band, he died. And then, but in a weird way, you kind of almost, I don't know, obviously you put this in your words, I'm just trying to explain what, what I'm after here. Um, I mean, I had a mate who died, you know, when he was 19, and it was almost like as if you sort of resented him for it, rather than, you know, if it, if it, I mean, you felt bad and everything, but it was like, all right, well, let's not talk about him anymore. But then with, with Tony dying, he's associated with that. You know, did, did it make everything hit home harder? In a way. It's that's a real, really funny thing, obviously. I mean, but when when Ian, Ian died, it was kind of like, you know, God, Ian's died, you know, he's committed suicide, the daft twat, what's he gone and done something like You know, and you felt, you felt anger. You didn't really, you didn't... Re- I think when you're young, you, you've not really come to terms with your own sort of mortality. I think you think everything's got to go on forever and, uh, like, Ian was going to be missing out on that and, you know, it was, it was daft. It was just a, just a stupid thing to do. Uh, I mean, you, yeah, you felt, you felt sad, but you, it was more... It was more anger, really. There was such... <laughs> that thing to do you know that there was nothing there was nothing that there was that bad that you had to take your own life that you couldn't get around it so yeah but nowadays uh i you know i i find it just it just floors me when um i find that somebody else said so tony's dying could floor me completely i mean when you're young you just sort of pick yourself up and get on with it but now when you get getting older, I think it's just like, it's just, it gets harder to deal with, really. For me personally, I find it very, very hard to deal with uh, uh, death at, the, at this time in my life. Um, because if, mm, it's like you think, well, soon there's not going to be anybody left to went through the same things that I went through. You know, everybody who was part of that, they are all going to be going there. And uh, Rob going, that was that was a bit of a shock and all, even though he wasn't exactly the most healthy person in the world. You never, never really expected to wake up one morning and Rob wasn't going to be there. It's like t- Tony, you never thought that there was going to be a time when Tony wasn't here. Uh... No, I just find uh, old age and the number of funerals that you find yourself going to, every one gets harder than the last one. And uh, what, what do you think Tony's legacy w- will be? Because uh, I, I know, he, I mean, I used to have loads of arguments with him about all sorts of stuff, and he used to get, I used to think he was a right, you know, a right Thatcherite, he was out for himself. <laughs> He'd, well, do you know what I mean? In a yes, weird way. Yeah. And he and he would he'd ignore everything except for his own bloody bands. Who gives a shit about to how we burgundy? This is going on, that's going on, and yet you all you're doing is But sort of later on down the line you think, well, in a weird way, everything that's going on has emanated from something that he's done, an idea he's put in your mind. And I shouldn't even be caring about this stuff. I should be getting on with a different kind of life. And it was almost like he, he was Pulling your strings without you even realising it. Yeah, he he did. Um, despite the fact that you were angry, well, you're having arguments with him all the time. You would you you would f- 
find that ultimately you'd have to you would have to agree with him like the, the number of times that you've had, we've had arguments with him but it was impossible to say to, to have an argument or have a real falling out with him because you just couldn't you could, i mean you could you, you could have a steaming row with him about something and then the next time you saw him it's like it's gone it's forgotten but he he was too clever really i think he was too clever for his own good well, he sort of disarmed you, made you feel like family. It, 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 and so, therefore, if you said anything really bad to him, it didn't really matter that next time you saw him. I think that's true, that. that yeah, it was, it was like having um, a, a row with your dad or your, your, your lovable uncle that, um, yeah, you could, you'd, have a di- you'd have a disagreement, but there weren't any grudges. There's nothing like that, uh, you know. And he'd always be right anyway. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Anything, is there anything else you want to say? Because obviously, I mean, I'll cut all this. So, you know, I'll, I'll cut it and edit it. Is there um, anything that you'd like to come across? I think this, the trouble with these things, as soon as you sit down in front of a microphone, your mind just goes... <laughs> Tell me about yeah, it. No, I've had 25 seven. years of it. <laughs> and as soon as you su- sh- shut your door at night, you think, that's what I should have said. You can, you can never bloody... Uh, Think of anything. Uh, I mean, it's this mad thing that you know um, that if you make it, you should never leave Manchester. And really, there is no logical reason why that should be true. And it's been adopted as some kind of mantra, and everyone says it now. When you think, yeah, but we when that was a big thing. I mean, they, all right, there was rabid records in Manchester. But, I mean, it, it was part of your punk ethic, the, the whole thing where we can do the show right here in the barn. And it was also because, I don't know, the, I resented the fact that the music industry was being run by people in London who just didn't seem totally connected to the world that I was living in. And... It, it wasn't really anything, anything that, that like you know, Manchester is, is is the greatest music capital of the world. It was just more that I, I'm not going to go to bloody London to do something so if I can do it just as well here. It, 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 it wasn't really that Manchester's great and London isn't. It was just I'm going to do it, and we're all going to do it on our own terms where we want to do it, and not be told we've got to go somewhere else to do it where we're going to be. Kissing someone else's boots to get in through the front door, you know, it was it was that kind of thing more than, um, you know, Man- Man- Manchester is got we've got to make this city great, but that was one of Tony's things. I'm just saying that for me personally, it wasn't so much that it was more. I don't I don't like to travel far. I like to get home for me tea. <laughs> that would do. That's my feeling. <laughs> <laughs> 